G'day and welcome to another episode of Perth Property Insider. I'm your host, Jared Mann, and today I'm really excited to be taking you inside all my thoughts and advice on how to renovate for profit. Now, I touched on renovating in episode two on choosing your property investment strategy, and it's really just a cornerstone, a key component of how you can add value in the easiest way possible to a property. Now, I'm certainly not suggesting that it's easy. That it Just because uh, the steps are easy, making a profit is actually quite hard. So in this uh, episode, I'm gonna be taking you through the different steps and how to think about a renovation, the reasons you might decide to get into renovating a property, most importantly, my rules to profit with a renovation, how to decide what to actually renovate. It's harder to do that than you think. How to reverse price your project to make sure you're not overpaying for the property to begin with or overcapitalizing on your renovation. And tips for buying under market value, things I've used myself, things that my clients have used to secure bargains even in a hot market that we're getting to. Suburb selection and what to look for there. And I'm going to be certainly covering off a lot more with examples and uh, a case study of my own uh, renovation than I did my very first one. So really looking forward to taking you through. Let's go inside. Welcome to Perth Property Insider, where you will learn how to grow your wealth and improve your life using Perth Property. Our show is brought to you by Investors Edge Real Estate, the highly rated and award-winning property management specialist servicing the whole of Perth. Now, here is your host, Jared Mann. In this episode, I wanted to share my rules and I guess advice on how to renovate for profit. If you're watching our video, you'll be able to see me all dusty and dirty on one of my renovation projects. And I'm looking like a bit of a dork. <laughs> And believe me, if you are hands-on in your renovations, be prepared to get dirty and uh, do all kinds of things that you never even knew needed doing until you get stuck into a project. But today, I guess I wanted to cover off some of the foundations and the rules and I guess take a bit of the gloss off of renovating that is so popularised by house rules and the block. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely love these shows, love watching them for ideas, and I certainly love all the politics and bitchiness that goes along with the contestants. Such a small space and uh, renovating alongside each other makes for great TV, doesn't it? But the reality from anyone uh, that has ever done a renovation would know, renovations are difficult. You need the right team, you need the right plan, and you need to always be aware that time is money. And the longer you take, the interest costs, the rates, all these things are continuing to require payment in the background. And you're also missing out on rent on the property and or a sale and the chance to, to move on to your next project or property. So time is definitely money when it comes to renovating. And I've also seen a lot of investors and homeowners overcapitalize on the work that they're doing. So spend way too much for what the area can handle and also makes, I guess, choices that don't add value to the overall property. And I've also seen a lot of mistakes made with regard to, I guess, how they you know, go about getting best bang for buck. So there's no point bringing in, um, you know, a kitchen or a bathroom renovation uh, company if it's going to cost double the price and be overcapitalizing for the area. So I'm not suggesting you need to do it all by yourself. And in future episodes, I will bring in some renovation project managers that can actually you know, make your dollar go much further and make the speed of your renovation a lot quicker. But you still need to be knowing what you're doing end to end and not just subjugate the responsibility to that project manager. You need to give them a budget. You need to work with them on timeframe 
and you need to be making sure as the investor that you're renovating to suit the rental or the sale market in the area. And that's where I can help as a property manager and real estate agent. And we know what works in you know pretty much all areas of Perth. We have property managers on the ground. I've sold in over 200 suburbs myself. We can very quickly know that if we're renovating a unit in a trendy area, we need to suit the Gen Y, you know, time poor person that, uh, you know, prefers the flashier things. If you're renovating a family home, you need to make the customizations that the family is going to appreciate and that's going to suit ultimately um, having kids and, and all the things that go with that. So let's take some of the shine off. But let's also focus on the real opportunity that renovating can give you when you do it to actually make a profit and it can really accelerate your journey and you know, help you get into your next property that much sooner as you build your equity. So first things first, I say to people, get your renovation steps and the order right. So you've got to start your planning ultimately first before you do your buying. And then you've got your, your doing and then you've got your renting and selling. But they all kind of link back on each other too. So you, you need to, in your planning phase, think about who that end tenant is or the end buyer market, as I just touched on. You need to work back from the renovated selling prices in the area, plan out a budget for your renovation, and the more accurate, the better. And obviously, when you've done this a few times, you can get down to the dollar and, and you need to leave yourself some buffer in that planning and that costing to make sure that you, you know, can account for some of these surprises that come out of left field, the electrics that need upgrading or the, the plumbing that needs doing that you don't account for. And in that planning phase, you also too need to sequence preferably your trades. So you don't want to be installing your carpets on first week before you've uh, painted the house. And when you get into the tighter spaces like a kitchen and bathroom, that sequencing is even more important. So try to think a few steps ahead of where you're at and start, you know, with the, the most obvious things. So it's going to be gutting out the property first where needed, doing all your preparations and then sequencing your trades in depending on what you're doing. So that planning ideally is done before you do your buying, especially the costing side. Because you'd be surprised how many investors come to us and say, thinking of doing a reno, I've already bought the property and they, they want to then make their renovation budget, I guess, fit into the property after, you know, to make sure they don't overcapitalize. But it should actually be the reverse way. You should be looking at what needs doing, working back from that renovated price and ensuring that you build in a profit margin too. So let's not forget about the profit people. That's the whole point of this. There are certainly other benefits to renovating, which I'll touch on in a minute. And then obviously, once you've bought, you, you know, get some things done during your settlement period. So you could uh, include in your contract conditions to have quotes done, to have tradespeople come, and you should really be getting all your quotes lined up during that buying phase ready to go straight into the doing so you condense the period as short as possible, have as little interest and opportunity costs lost. And then, you know, you would be involving your property manager and or sale agent, depending on your intended outcome, you'd be involving them from the very start in the planning phase. And then you'd seamlessly go into renting and selling and possibly staging the properties for the sale. And with the rental side, you, you really want to be presenting as well as possible too. Is now a right time to renovate? Well, it certainly was an ideal time until we had our building grants happen, start sucking all the trades out of the market to becoming too busy. You can still get things accomplished with trades, but that's the one negative to this time to consider renovation as a strategy. But there's a 
secret weapon to getting access to trades and that's working with your property manager and choosing them before you start your renovation before you even you know buy your property they can advise you on the future things that are going to be needed for rentability what aspects to improve if you wanting to attract tenants and make it as i guess set up as well as possible to you know have as long a life of the different fittings in them tenants can be a bit more hard wearing on properties than you may be if you were living in there so you want to make smart choices on your, your colors and your your the quality of your fixtures so that they're durable and that property manager is going to have all their trades too so that's the secret weapon and property managers trades have usually been you know especially in our case they've been with us 12 years they're highly responsive we can get them out you know usually within the week of ordering and of course we've got access to all the ones that are typically needed in a renovation or at least 90 percent of them so some of the other things that are favorable for now being the time to renovate is that buyers are still time poor and a lot of them look at a renovation and think, no, I'd rather just buy a beautiful finished product. I want, I'd rather just buy a solution. So you can certainly see that the market is willing to pay for that end solution that you can provide in renovating. And the exciting thing about uh, where the market's headed and you know prices increasing month on month at the moment in most areas is that we can now count on our end selling prices again. So the hardest part uh, when we're in a downward market is you start out factoring in the current market and by the time you finish your renovation, you may find that the market's dropped further. Thankfully, now we can look at sale data, we can chat with agents, find out you know how properties are going in the area with the sales chat with me to get my input of course as well and we can really plan a solid price to work back from knowing that if the market increases uh, over the time of our renovation that's a nice bonus and it builds in some buffer but never in my opinion uh, try not to factor in the increases in the market that uh, are going to come work from today's value is always a good way to do it now the final point to why now's a good time is that we've got relatively low holding costs. So unlike when we've been up at uh, seven to 10% interest in the past, when I've been doing some of my renovations, every day is a hell of a lot more expensive in those times, but now at sub 3% and sub, you know, some people are paying higher 1%, you've got really low holding costs. So if it takes an extra month, it's really not the end of the world and you won't have a, as much interest to pay. Three real strong positive reasons to renovate now and the fourth with the, the availability of trades can be get around, got around by involving your property manager. Now, what are some of the reasons to renovate besides the obvious reason of making a profit? Well, you don't always realize this until you get into further stages after you've held it, held the property for a while, but you'll definitely attract a better quality of tenant on the other side if you're renting it out. And that means a lot less headaches for you, a lot less chance and probability of there being rent defaults, of there being damage to a property because a quality property attracts a quality tenant and that just makes everything else easier from there. So if I had my way, I'd renovate every property before we took it under management. <laughs> so next uh, real positive reason to renovate is that you can increase your rental yield. And that's going to make holding the property a lot easier, improve your cash flow situation. And the third reason is obviously to add the value with the plan to withdraw that equity and put it to work for you again. So one of the key principles for making a property investment is not always looking at return on investment each year, but looking at the return of your initial investment. So if you're putting 25% odd into a property for your deposit and your stamp duty and your settlement costs, then you really want to get that back out as quickly as possible because then you can go again with buying something else. 
So if you come and do a renovation and you can add 10, 15%, perhaps 20% if you really buy well and, and really do your renovation in a very smart and quick way, you're going to be that much closer to making your next purchase and that equity can be you know, refinanced back out and put to work. So that's that return of investment is very important and a good reason to be renovating almost on every purchase if you can. So another reason to renovate might be when you've held the property for a while, you want to maintain its value and just keep, keep your asset value up. That helps with obviously refinancing, helps with the first few reasons I've mentioned of increasing its yield and attracting a better quality tenant. But if you've held your properties a while, do think about when you're changing over tenants, uh, going in and doing a cosmetic renovation and getting all these benefits, it can definitely be worthwhile. And the other final point is reducing maintenance and hassles. So maintenance really does eat in to your ongoing cash flow. And if you can spend the money all at the beginning or you know in, in your renovation, it's going to make the holding costs later a lot less and you're not going to have the continual hassles coming up that uh, make you sometimes make some people regret owning an investment property you know when you we never like uh, contacting owners all the time and telling them about things that need to be done for maintenance and obviously we're going to try to troubleshoot those maintenance things as much as possible make sure that it it's a genuine thing that has to fall on the owner if it's uh, if there's any room for us to hold the tenant accountable we certainly will but it doesn't make it fun to have a property that's throwing off lots of maintenance all the time. So that can be another great reason to get it up to, you know, fully renovated standard. And then it's a lot easier for us to also hold the tenants accountable and see where they, you know, have, you know, ever da damaged the property or, you know, when it's not dirty, uh, see where, where, where it's dirty and needing attention. So over the 12 odd years that I've had my agency, you know, I guess I've, I started investing in property another five years before that. You sound old already, doesn't it? I've, I guess I've come up with a number of renovation rules and they're as much formulated to stop me from making mistakes as well as to solve some of the mistakes I've seen our clients making. So when you think about your budget and where you're spending your money on a renovation, you really want to be getting back at least $2 for every dollar you spend. Why? Because there's a lot of effort involved in doing a renovation and you need to ensure that, you know, you're at least factoring in your time and making that worthwhile. And even if you get a renovation project manager or even if uh, your partner does it when, and they might not be working as much and, you, you know, basically take this on as a, a part-time gig, either way, you've got to factor in your time and make sure that it's all worthwhile doing so two dollars at least for every dollar spent and you want to be making sure if you're doing a cosmetic reno the rough rule of thumb is to try to stick to no more than 10 percent of the value now of course you can look deeper to make sure that you know work back from the renovated selling price and we're going to touch on how to reverse price a property soon to work out if you're overcapitalizing and what to pay for the property but when you're generally spending over 10%, you have to be a lot more careful that you're, you haven't got, you know, if there's a strong ceiling on prices in the area and you're not going to find someone with the budget to make, you know, this renovation stack up, you've really got to be careful when you start spending over 10% on a cosmetic renovation. Now, of course, if you're doing a structural renovation and you're, extending and adding a living area and bedrooms and whatnot again you'd still want to reverse price and make sure you're not overspending but you can spend a lot more in your overall budget and i'd also suggest that you bring those structural renovations in areas that can certainly handle it you wouldn't want to do it in a cookie cutter area you'd want to be focusing on the premium suburbs where people are prepared to pay the extra for bigger bigger houses with more bedrooms more living so I'd also focus on taking the property to an overall even standard. Now, why is that? Because I've sold and rented enough properties that have been renovated and enough properties that haven't to know that 
buyers and tenants, it's just human nature, I think, love, you know, tearing down their thoughts or what they're prepared to pay for a property if there's a number of things that aren't to the overall standard. So let's take the situation where someone might choose to renovate one bathroom but not the other. Well, that one bathroom that's not renovated is significantly going to tear down the value that someone's prepared to pay for, for this property. So you want to take everything to an even standard so it, it can't be picked on. And then you want to introduce, you know, typically two to three wows to the property. Now that might be an amazing, you know, splashback and kitchen area with, you know, under cupboard lighting and, you know, fantastic appliances and, you know, overhead cupboards and, you know, something that you can really get excited about if you love, uh, you know, being in the kitchen. It might be a fabulous outside uh, water feature and gardens uh, around back feature point. It could be, there's, there's so many things you can do. I mean, in a house that we're living in at the moment, we've used really lovely and amazing wallpapers at the entry that take, take you in to the living. And we, in our uh, theatre room, we've done another, you know, awesome blocked black, you know, classic kind of theatre backing uh, wallpaper in there and we've got our back of projector screen lighting and you know we've got our underbench lighting that shines down on marble tile and you know there's just uh, choose two, two or three things that a buyer can latch onto and get really excited that has them see sees them pay an emotional price and that's our goal with those those wows that we put in so also remember to style a property to suit that property's, I guess, type, era, age built and the area and ultimately what those tenants and buyers are looking for. So there's no point doing it to suit your taste if everyone else in the area is looking for something different. And that's where going into other home opens, uh, seeing what's out and about, seeing what's on realestate.com is really going to give you a good feel for that. And uh, think about what your target buyer will or tenant will want in the property. So that can add a lot of emotional appeal when you set the styling right. Now, another rule, focus on what you can see first. So people often spend a lot of money on the inside, create an amazing renovation, but then they forget about, you know, doing the same for the outside. And when I say outside, I mean front of property. So you get maybe five seconds to make a first impression. And after that, someone's deciding whether or not to get out of their car or keep driving. So I've sold enough properties where the front has just been horrible. And you, when you're at your home open, you get people slowing down, and taking a look, and you hear the, the car race off again. And you, you know, you're definitely not getting them to buy the property. So if you know, the outside, you need to be looking at, you know, does it need render? Do, do you need to have the gardens, uh, you know, really improving and landscaping them, making sure that if there's large areas, you don't necessarily want huge areas of grass. You want to introduce, you know, different textures. You want to put stone paths in or, you know, properly landscape the front. If the driveway needs work, you want to do that. If the, you know, make sure all the gutters, everything has to be schmick with its painting. And first impression is everything when it comes to any property. So another rule, reverse price and make sure you build in your profit. And I've mentioned that a few times previously, but certainly very important when it comes to the rules. Remember that time is money and to use professionals. So I've painted enough houses myself to know how much is involved in painting a house, as an example. And I take so much longer than a professional coming and doing it hard out for two to three days. I could take two to three months and still not get as good a quality job. So don't underestimate painting. And I think I may even mention that later in this classic one that people think they can do well. And you see some people's uh, versions of well with slop paint up everywhere I wish they hadn't painted it at all so just remember time is money now 
why does everyone focus on the house when they're renovating and, and looking for a place to buy? The location is something that can't be changed no matter how good your house is. So you really need to be choosing a location that can handle and support the increase in the value of the house because otherwise it's going to limit and put a ceiling on your number of buyers that are going to be interested and what they're prepared to pay. And, you know, a, a buyer with more money is going to be very picky on location. And for instance, when we were have been recently looking amazing renovations and other extensions that we've seen in some properties, we then go and check the surrounding neighbors. They might be homes West. There might be a, you know, you rotate around on the street view, you see high voltage power lines out the front and a big, you know, power pole stuck in the middle of their front lawn. You look at, consider potential, potentially laneways can have a negative impact or, you know, if they're across from a public open space, you know, sump, sewer sump area, you know, all these things need to be uh, properly investigated and thought out because you can't change them later and the house does have to come second to the location so there's my two four six eight renovation rules if you get those right you're going to be 90 percent of the way to being profitable with your renovation now when we start to think about and decide what to renovate there's a few pointers here so i would always focus on the maintenance things because especially if your tenant's sitting out that's going to become very obvious very quickly to any incoming tenant and your property manager is going to be telling you as soon as they do their property condition report of the property and a lot of people intending to sell don't really think about the standard uh, warranty clauses that buyers generally expect to have in a contract to have all the electrical plumbing and gas in working order now that's pretty basic stuff that should be done and you know Where it's lacking, it makes the buyers think, oh, what else could be wrong? If the basics aren't here and working, what else have they cut corners on? And then where you get the biggest bang for your buck is the cosmetics that are seen. So focusing on them and how to get that first impression right and taking it to an overall standard, that's what you focus on and and spend your dollars on. Now, the areas that don't get you much of a return and are often hidden and sight unseen, but sometimes necessary. And that's why I suggest you strongly consider about whether you're going to go ahead with a purchase of such a property and you should be including subject to satisfactory building and pest inspection when you're going about purchasing it and then, you know, factoring in the, these larger costs that can be hidden structural costs that will come up on a building inspection often when you go to sell. So you really need to take care of them. And uh, utility upgrades can be very expensive in some of these older character houses if you have to upgrade the electric board or upgrade the plumbing. Just be conscious of investigating them and making it subject to satisfaction of them when you're purchasing a property. And then you really don't have a choice about renovating them if you have to. So some other tips for deciding what to renovate. I uh, love to go around to display homes for the latest ideas. Karina and I make it a bit of a weekend hobby sometimes when we're going past some. I'd involve your property manager from the start to advise on you know, rentability and suitability of choices. I'd run through a checklist of the overall home when you're buying it to make sure that you've considered all the different aspects and you're encompassing them in your budget. I've got, a, I've got such a checklist if you want to reach out. I actually had to force myself to use a checklist recently when we've been looking to buy because I, even though when I'm buying for investment, I can be a lot more logical about my choices and my checklists and I can you know make objective decisions. But when I'm buying for my home, I just get very, very emotional about it and I can overlook things. So after the first few properties we got serious on when I found, you know, some big negatives when I got deeper into looking at them and I was kind of lucky that I did check the, check it out at the last minute when we were uh, in one case already involved in a negotiation and had put an offer in, should have uh, followed my own advice and used the checklist even when you're buying for your personal home and it's when you need it most to make yourself 
look at all the aspects and not leave anything out. Firm up quotes during your settlement period, I mentioned that, and uh, make your offer subject to electrical, plumbing, and gas in working order and satisfaction of the building and first inspection. So that'll really set you up for the right things to renovate. Now, how do we reverse price? I've touched on it a few times earlier in the episode, and I just want to give you a basic example so that when someone talks about reverse pricing, you know what they mean, and you can do this basic one on the back of an envelope. So you start with the renovated selling price in the area, chat to me to find out what similar are selling for. You look online, you cross check the feedback that I've given. You may wish to call one or two agents and just get an overall consensus of what your overall house size would be worth if it was renovated to its you know full potential. You can explain to to us what you're planning to do. We can see what the house size and the location is and what similar properties have sold for and give you that feedback. Now, I'd always then work on a minimum return on investment of 10% of total expenses. Now, you may be able to work on higher, but my minimum is 10%. It's great if you can get to 15%. 10% is, should be your absolute minimum. So start with your renovated selling price. You take off your budgeted reno expenses. And remember earlier I mentioned you want to try to keep it to less than 10% ideally of your renovated selling price. So in this case, if we, if we had a $400,000 renovated selling price, we wouldn't ideally want to try to spend over 40000 on our reno. Let's take the case that we're spending 30000 We're doing a quicker cosmetic renovation and we would then want to count and take off our transfer duty and settlement costs so 40 400,000 minus 30,000 minus 11,500 leaves us with 358,500 and then we can take off our holding costs and then we divide by 1.1 if we're working out our minimum ROI of 10%. So 1.1 is 110. And when we divide the previous figure by that, we arrive at 321,835 in this example. And I factored in 5% holding costs for interest, but you can use a little less. And I factored in three months. Of course, if you want to see the slide, check our show notes and uh, go through to our Investors Edge website and you can see all the slides from today on video there. So basics of reverse pricing is to take the renovated selling price, take off all your expenses, and then you divide by 1.1. And this is the back of the envelope, quick calculation. So in this case, we'd need to buy for approximately 322,000. And that would leave us with a you know return of approximately 10% and make sure we're not doing it for nothing. So how do we go about selecting a suburb? It's a very important question. We want to be looking through to the stats and we can see these on my favourite source is RP Data. Uh, It's generally very expensive and only most agents would have access to it. So I would chat with an agent to to get some of this uh, data. There are other sites out there that have it, but you want to look for the median price trending up And you want to look for the average selling days trending down. And then you really want to look for there being enough margin between what renovated properties are going for and what it's going to be possible to purchase a property for, an unrenovated property for. So I usually find that there's little, a lot lesser margin in the lower and cookie cutter areas where, you know, People are limited in their affordability and their budgets and, you know, don't always value a renovation in the same way that they would in a more premium area. So it can really work in in any suburb, but premium areas are going to be easier to make it work. So there's definitely more margin in the older character and premium areas. So tips for buying under market value. How do you stack the odds in your favour to be able to negotiate a good price? I look for leased properties as a strategy, believe it or not. So a leased property will turn a lot of the home buyers off because they will want to 
have vacant possession. A lease property, you know, will also most likely not present as well because the tenants are usually not supportive of the sale unless it's a property that I'm selling and I do everything possible to get them on on board and I, you know, help them with their move if they have to move. And often if they've done a really good job and they're a great tenant, we'd move them into another property of ours. So, but generally speaking, uh, the majority of tenants are not going to be presenting a house as well. And it's going to cut it off to home buyers. It's a great way to be more negotiable, to find a seller that's more negotiable. And that kind of also plays into finding ugly duckling properties. They're just waiting to become a beautiful swan. And they're going to turn a lot of buyers off by how they're presenting, but you need to look through to the potential. Look for out-of-area agents. Now, the majority of the time when a local area specialist sells out of area, they're not used to it. They really don't know the values and they can get things drastically wrong. My approach is very different as far as a selling agent goes because I'm used to selling in uh, a you know, different suburb every week and I've sold in most suburbs before and I'm very good at getting up to speed quickly on values in different areas and have been doing it for 12 years. When the average agent goes into a new area, they're doing it once a year. They're not familiar and they often get it wrong. So look for out of area agents. The seller's situation. Now, you can't expect a, a good selling agent to ever divulge this or to give you much of an insight. But uh, the ordinary agents will, will tell you, sometimes unintentionally. So you ask probing questions. Why is the owner selling? Have they bought a new property yet? Are they looking for a quick sale? You can have a bit of a, a look-see in the robes if they've already been cleared out and all the kids, you know, stuff's gone as well. Then they've already moved on and bought something. It's likely they're going to want to get a sale. Believe it or not, if half of the clothes are gone, you can infer that that could be a separation happening. So just you know, probe to see what the seller's situation is and that can come in handy later on when uh, you're getting down to the negotiation stage. Make sure that you've got your cash and your finance ready. Often if a seller has had a finance fall over, they can ex be willing to accept less if someone uh, you know, is able to put a strong offer to them with, uh, you know, at least an 80% or less loan to value ratio. So they don't have lenders mortgage insurance. And, you know, you can, if you can get all your ducks in a row and settle quickly, that can be very appealing for some people that just want to move on. And that brought me to my next point of a quick settlement period. So if you know that you could, you're pre-approved and you can get finance in 14 days and settle in a further 14 days, that's going to be a lot more appealing to a long settlement period with a higher offer, potentially your lower offer could actually, the settlement could tip in favor of you. So how I bought my first few properties as well was doing a flyer drop around a suburb and I used to do this in a very leveraged way. If my brother's listening, he's five years younger than me and in my early twenties, I used to drop him off on his bike and he'd go around and spot all the ugly duckling houses in a suburb and put a flyer in their mailbox saying, I'm cashed up, ready to buy, looking for a house like yours, call me, quick decisions. And that's how I bought my first two properties. So it definitely works. And these kind of more creative out there strategies are certainly worth considering for how hot the market is at the moment. If you can be dealing with a seller direct, not have uh, an agent in the way, find out their true situation, their needs and what they're looking for and put an offer together crafted to suit it, their needs of either a quick or a long settlement or, you know, show that you've got the strength in your finance, then, you know, you're going to be able to usually pay less because you're giving someone what they want. Biggest factors affecting your sale price. These are often overlooked and they've been the cause of many a mistake over the years. And so I wanted to cover them off for you. The size and number of the living areas is so, so key. So if you're targeting larger families, they're not going to look at a house with one living area. And 
you know, you really need to consider the size of these living areas and how many of them there are as a very key factor because you can renovate a small house, but you're going to still be left with a limited buyer pool. Next, I come to size of the bedrooms. So if you are intending the property to, you know, appeal to families with teenagers or two independent adults or three adults living together, you need to ensure that bedrooms can at least hold a king size single uh, bed or preferably a double or a queen size beds if you want adults to be in them. So that's very important. Something that you can't change easily if it's wrong in those first two things. And then street presentation. A massive one, I had mentioned it earlier as being a key factor. Car accommodation is something that's often you know, forgotten about. People that drive nice cars like their cars to be in garages, unless of course carports are the norm and having to be the case to fit in with the character of the area, then that's the exception to this rule. But if you've got no car accommodation at all, then you're really gonna struggle to attract quality market of tenants or buyers. So you really wanna be addressing that in your renovation as well. And I've mentioned the overall street presentation, but the neighbors is key as well. And I often like to go and meet the neighbors. That's what I did on one of the last uh, offers I was pers- we were negotiating for our family home and just you know find out the goss of the area. You've got that neighbor that always loves to tell you what's going on here and there. And the neighbor that I was talking to even went as far as to tell me what the owner was wanting as far as price for their house. So that blew me away. That was great inside information to know. Some tips for the doing stage. We've spoken a lot about the planning and the the buying stages so far. Now I want to go into some of the doing. So consider using a project manager or a builder to get their input from the start and then factor their cost into your budget. So if you're including their cost and still making a profit, then, you know, you've really got to consider the value of your time. And and that's how I prefer to do renovations these days. Don't underestimate the importance of having a quality paint job. I touched on uh, the nightmares I've seen earlier and uh, the time that it does take to get it right. Ensure that you source your materials, preferably from auctions and online marketplaces and discount warehouses. That all adds up when you can get your overall materials for 20 or 30% less than retail. Use your property manager's trusted trades, electrical, plumbing, and handyman especially we have that are extremely reliable. And I always love to, where possible, use your friends and family for better rates, providing they can fit your schedule. Now, it is really hard when someone's doing you a massive favour and uh, giving you either low or no rates, and it's hard to, uh, you know, demand um, when and where that they're you know going to come and work on your house so you do need to be a bit more flexible and try to accommodate when they're free of course Um, but if you can leverage your network that's really going to be a way especially on your first few deals of building in more sweat equity that's going to show up in the, the value increase without the cost to get there so i wanted to take you through my very first reno that i have fond memories of I bought it out in Huntingdale for 189000 off of a letter drop. The bank valued it at 240000 at the time of settlement, and we could rent it out at 260 per week. If you're looking at our uh, video here, you can see a picture of how the front was on the left with the broken down uh, letterbox leaning, bushes everywhere, couldn't be seen, and then uh, one of the pictures on the right of how we've transformed it. So with you know render and a roof restoration gardens manicured new letterbox uh, paving um, you know nice meticulous reticulated lawn and just a completely different house so we spent 33,000 on a full renovation inside and out we did the painting kitchen bathroom floor coverings blinds render roof restoration landscaping it took us four months working nights and weekends so I certainly learned a lot through that, learned what I wouldn't do again. And then at the end, we rented it for 380 per week. So that's a good $120 a week more. 
and we got it revalued for 320. So that was an 85K profit. And of course, some of that profit was from buying well, some of that profit was from the renovation and uh, that factored in uh, stamp duty and holding costs as well uh, after they were taken out already. So it was a nice profit to make at 85,000 for four months work and an example of what's possible when you do buy well, renovate in the cosmetic areas that are going to be seen and add the most of value and, um, you know, massively increased its rental return as well as its equity. So there's some photos if you are checking us on YouTube. God, that bathroom was ugly. We had blue vanity, uh, light blue bath, blue walls, yellow kitchen, would you believe? And we had a green bedroom. We went for the trifecta of rainbow color in that house. So we brought it to a lot of neutrals, mocha tones, used dark color carpet. You know, we did end up renting the property out for a number of years later selling it for 360 I believe, when we were regrouping some money. You can see we did a, a bit of a wow fountain out the back there. That's the kind of wows that I like to talk about. And in the kitchen, we did a really nice, uh, amazing uh, feature splashback there that was the centerpiece, I guess, of the room. And uh, just took everything to an overall even standard so that, you know, the, the bathroom presents really well, kitchen, all floor coverings, window treatments, inside, outside, even overall standard and renovated to suit the market in that area. So that's when I was starting out and buying the most, uh, the best located property I could afford, which, you know, I couldn't afford much in those days. So a lot of people don't often touch on the final stage, which is your exit strategy. If you're going to sell, you need to factor in your selling costs into your budget as well. And if you're going to rent and revalue, you need to really think about how you handle the valuers and support your best valuation price that you can. So I can help with that as a by providing an appraisal with uh, sales that are you know selected to best reflect the and maximize your renovated value value that we put down and i usually in that pack for the valuer include before photos include the market appraisal and in, and you know give them an idea of how much has gone into everything that has been replaced and upgraded so that gives the valuer some context because when they're coming in, especially if you're getting trying to get it revalued three or four months later, and it might be a lot harder to do these days with the banks being so anal, but you've really got to substantiate and justify the value increase so that the value is going to be comfortable, you know, coming back with that higher price. Now, the thing that everyone forgets, and I touched on it in a previous episode, was considering your taxes and you know, before you purchase the property, you should always set it up in the most appropriate entity after speaking with your accountant. If you're planning to sell, it may be worth, you know, doing that in a family trust or company structure so that you can distribute gains around to lower tax, you know, tax members of your family. And consider the taxes in your overall returns because a lot of people, you know, pay this as an afterthought, they do their renovations poorly. They end up with limit. They don't factor in a bit and you know protect their profit. They then might make you know three to five percent at best. They don't even know what they've actually spent on the on the renovation. They don't know if they are profitable, and they go and pay tax. And they may as well have just uh, you know taken another hobby on the weekends and been a lot, lot less stressed rather than coordinating a renovation and. Uh, there is always some stress involved in these things, even if you get a project manager to do it. So consider your taxes, please. Now, how can we help? So I've mentioned at a few points how we can help at Investor's Edge, ensure that you aren't making those mistakes, ensure that things do stack up. I can personally help you with renovated selling prices for areas and advising on what uh, the tenants and or buyers want. I can help you with rental prices, uh, obviously before uh, at the before stage, because you may choose to uh, rent it out for a while before you do your renovation. And I can obviously 
give you feedback on the likely increase in rental price after you've renovated and give you advice on what to renovate. And, you know, you certainly want to have the outcome in mind of either selling or renting and, you know, tailoring what, what you do accordingly. And we can obviously give you access to reliable trades. So they the, the ways that we can massively help you with your next renovation. Feel free to get in touch. Our details are at investorsedge.com.au. Now, finally, I hope you've been enjoying our first uh, lot of episodes on Perth Property Insider. I'm having a lot of fun in bringing them to you and I've got some exciting guests coming up, exciting other topics that I'm going to cover. If you have any topics that you'd love to see me cover, do reach out and let me know. If you're enjoying these updates, make sure you you know, send us an email and let me know. I had a lovely email this morning from someone saying how much uh, my market updates have helped them know the market. And they bought a family home in September in Duncraig and market's already moved up strongly since and they're so glad that they got in and saw my announcing of uh, the bottoming of the market. So I'm sure that they're going to do very well there. I love to hear what uh, people get out of these. It gives me a real buzz and keeps me going. So also make sure you go to our website and join my property investor update. It's where I send out a notice of our different podcast episodes that get released. And there's also the option there of getting uh, market data sent to you on given suburbs every six months. So we prepare market data reports for over 200 suburbs and keep everyone updated every six months on how they're areas are going so when you join our investor update make sure you include the suburbs in that field so that's at investorsedge.com.au slash join and uh, make sure if you're listening on uh, itunes or your favorite podcasting app that you subscribe to us it really helps us be found and i'd love and certainly appreciate a rating if you could give us a five-star review that'd be great but i'm also keen to get any feedback on what you think of the show Thanks and uh, see you on the inside next time.